Welcome to AviaFly, the YouTube history channel with aircraft, airlines, and aviation podcasts. German and French language terms appear in this podcast. We can't pronounce these terms correctly. It remains with an English pronunciation, which the listener may forgive us and hopefully can take with great humor. Today's topic. From the beginnings of aviation, part 3, flights around the Eiffel Tower. Immediately after the first balloons went up, the aeronauts began their efforts to make their balloons steerable so that they would no longer be the plaything of the wind. After many failures, the airship was born, for which powerful engines of acceptable weight had to be developed. The balloon is a plaything of the wind, and its use is thus limited to scientific and sporting purposes. Since the rise of the first balloons, many inventors have been concerned with the problem of how to make aircraft steerable to get from one place to another. Benjamin Franklin, an eyewitness to the first balloon flights in Paris, wrote, Not to be calculated would be the advantage if the art of aeronautics made great progress if it taught the horizontal direction of air balls because then men and goods could be placed over mountains and seas with the greatest ease and speed. As early as 1783, the birth year of aviation, Franklin proposed an original application to use balloons tethered at high altitudes as a refrigerator for food. In 1784, the Academy in Luan received no fewer than 96 suggestions when it held a competition to make flying vehicles steerable. Most of the suggestions were simple-minded, unrealistic, and ineffectual. Many saw flapping wings, oars, steering, or even sails as the solution. Since the balloon is driven by the wind and thus has no inherent speed relative to the surrounding air, steers must fail. But even with oars moved by muscle power, nothing can be done because of the large surface area of balloons or airships. Joseph Montgolfier put forward the idea that the fire used to heat the air could also be used to propel the balloon by holding the ship against the air at an angle, so that it would rise or fall depending on the fire. To do this, he proposed attaching wings to the balloon that could be moved up or down, depending on the balloon's movement. Model tests showed that the method was ineffective even in weak headwinds, not to mention the large amounts of fuel required the aircraft would have had to carry. Thus, Montgolfier's only option was to cleverly use the different air currents as effectively as possible. The Frenchman Milan and Janinet fought to use the recoil principle. In 1785, they built a 30-meter-high balloon with a side opening from which the escaping hot air was to generate the recoil. Before the first ascent, the balloon caught fire. The impractical idea was not pursued further. Jean-Baptiste Musnier, on the other hand, came up with the idea of using an air screw. The inventor referred to it as a spinning rudder. Because of the lower air resistance, he projected an elongated balloon body and envisaged a ballonet. The inner of the three nested envelopes was to contain the hydrogen gas. At the same time, the next formed the ballonet so that bellows could be used when the gas heated up or cooled down to equalize the volume and thus keep the airship constantly bulging. The third outer envelope was provided only for reasons of greater strength. Musnier planned airships with a volume of up to 79,000 cubic meters but had to resign because only muscle power was available to drive the propeller. One technician noted, but where will we find this motive power? I am forced to admit that I am close to giving up hope. Creative ideas were mixed with many great and even foolish suggestions. In 1801, Jacob Kaiserer said he wanted to fly a balloon using eagles in Vienna. Trained eagles, controlled by a whip, would power the balloon. Several times, the use of millwheel-like paddle wheels was proposed. One project envisaged two horses as the power source. Jacob Deegan experimented with flapping wings, the Englishman Hubel with hand-driven propellers, and the Frenchman Delamarne and Jan envisaged lifting screws for their streamlined balloon in addition to propellers for vertical motion but achieved success only in complete calm. During the Siege of Paris in 1870-71, the French naval engineer Dupuis de Lomé proposed the construction of a 36-meter long muscle-powered airship based on Musnier's work, which was built. Eight strong men turned the shaft for the propeller. In calm conditions, a speed of up to 11 km per hour was achieved, but this was far too little to match the forces of the wind. First Airships Powered by Engines One of the first proposals to power an airship with a steam engine came from the English aerodynamicist, Sir George Cayley. His sketches from 1837 show flapping wings or propellers. 
In 1843, Laneberger of Nuremberg envisioned a steam airship with an elongated balloon made of brass, in addition to the passengers, he wanted to house the steam engine, the apparatus for generating the lifting gas, and the propeller in the ship-like gondola. Airship models with steam and clockwork propulsion were built in England and France and were tested with success. The first steam-powered airship was built in 1852 by the French engineer Henri Gifford, who lived from 1825 to 1882. He had the small steam engine installed in a gondola, which had an output of 3 horsepower and weighed only 160 kilograms, ready for operation. It was driven by a three-bladed propeller, and Gifford envisaged only a tiny rudder. During test runs, the airship reached a speed of 7 to 11 kilometers per hour calculated by the engineer. However, the design of the balloon body, which was 44 meters long and a maximum of 12 meters wide, was regressive because it did not ensure that the envelope would bounce. This was to be Henri Gifford's undoing three years later when he and a companion ascended aboard a new airship. The balloon body, equipped with the same steam engine, measured 70 meters in length with a capacity of 3,200 cubic meters but had a diameter of no more than 10 meters. The advantages of lower frontal resistance were negated by more excellent frictional resistance so that no higher speed could be obtained than the first type. Because of the backward design of the balloon body, the net thrown over it, from which the gondola hung, slipped backward. The airmen could only save themselves by pulling the valve line. Before the gondola hit the ground, the balloon body had freed itself from the net. Gifford's injuries in the accident did not deter him from further airship projects. He hoped that the larger the airship, the easier it would be to overcome the technical difficulties of propulsion. In this way, the French engineer arrived at plans for a gigantic airship, which, with a length of almost 600 meters and a diameter of 30 meters, envisaged a volume of 220,000 cubic meters. The giant, for which the designer did not envisage a rigid framework, was to carry a 30-ton steam engine. Henri Gifford, who had become wealthy as the inventor of the steam jet pump, had already allocated 1 million francs for the project but committed suicide due to depression. In 1865, the German engineer Paul Heinlein received an English patent for the propulsion of airships by gas engines. To avoid accommodating a gas generator in the gondola, the inventor came up with the idea of taking the propellant gas from the balloon and compensating for the pressure loss by inflating the balloon more. After building an 11-meter model of his dirigible, he found the support of a Vienna corporation to construct the 50.4-meter long Eolus. It was 9.2 meters in diameter and held 2,400 cubic meters of gas. Experience from shipbuilding ensured a streamlined shape. The airship, equipped with a 6-horsepower gas engine, made successful test flights in Brno, reaching a speed of 19 kilometers per hour. For cost reasons, the continuation of the tests had to be abandoned. The invention of the Cologne-born engineer became a victim of the economic crisis of 1873. The model of the brothers Albert and Gaston Tissandier for an airship powered by an electric motor attracted great interest at the Paris Electricity Exhibition in 1881. This encouraged the two airship men to realize their project. The result was a 28-meter-long airship with a diameter of 9.2 meters and a volume of 1,060 cubic meters, whose two-bladed propeller was 2.85 meters in diameter. The electric motor had an output of just under 1 kilowatt but weighed around 200 kilograms, including batteries. Nevertheless, the Tissandier brothers achieved a speed of 9 kilometers per hour in October 1883. With a more powerful electric motor and an improved steering sail, they reached 11 to 14 kilometers per hour in calm conditions the following year. But this did not solve the propulsion problem. However, their circles over Paris made a great impression on the public. On August 9, 1884, for the first time in the history of aviation, a motor-powered airship succeeded in returning to the launch site and landing there. Charles Renard and A.C. Krebs can claim this success. The two captains of the French engineering forces had been commissioned in 1878 to build a serviceable dirigible. However, after a model was completed, the War Department refused to fund the project. That's when former Interior Minister Leon Gambetta stepped in with 400,000 francs. La France was built at the Chilean Newton military balloon base near Paris. The designers gave the 50.4-meter-long balloon body a good streamlined shape. 
The 35-meter-long gondola, covered with silk and canvas, was made of bamboo tubes. This is also where the exceptionally lightweight accumulator battery and the electric motor were housed, with an output of 9 horsepower. Propulsion was provided by a wooden propeller 9 meters in diameter. The airship's center of gravity could be continuously adjusted utilizing a running weight. During the first test flight, the La France showed excellent maneuverability so that the engineers had no difficulty returning to the launch site after the electric airship had been airborne for a quarter of an hour. The return to the launch site was triumphant on five of seven trips, during which a maximum speed of 23.4 km per hour was recorded. The battery capacity was not sufficient for longer trips. A four-stroke engine was installed in an airship for the first time around 1895 by the German Dr. Hermann Wolfert. It was only 28 meters long and, with a diameter of 8.5 meters, had a volume of just 875 cubic meters. Dr. Wolfert had a gasoline engine of 8 horsepower installed and, in addition to a propeller for propulsion for vertical steering, a jacking screw. After entirely satisfactory test runs, an accident occurred on the Tempelhofer Feld near Berlin on June 12, 1897, which could have been avoided by more constructive prudence. The airship had only been in the air for a few minutes when a large flame burst from the gondola. With a huge bang, the entire balloon body was immediately engulfed in flames. The cause of the accident, in which Dr. Wolfert and his mechanic lost their lives, has never been satisfactorily clarified. The distance between the gondola and the envelope was only 2 meters, so the ignition of escaping hydrogen was easily possible due to a defect in the gasoline engine. As early as 1851, Prosper Meller in France had projected an all-metal airship whose balloon body was made of thin sheet iron, however, the plans were never implemented. Thus, the Austrian engineer David Swartz is credited with having built the first rigid airship, made of aluminum, the price of which had dropped sharply as production increased. The balloon body, which had the shape of a slightly compressed cylinder, was pointed at the front and slightly concave at the rear. The volume was around 3,500 cubic meters. The power of the 400-kilogram Daimler gasoline engine, which delivered 10 to 12 horsepower, was transmitted via drive belts to an approximately 3-meter propeller at the end of the engine room. Two smaller propellers are mounted on the side of the ship. Turning maneuvers were to be accomplished by turning off one of the side propellers. David Swartz died months before the test flight of his airship, which was the first and only flight, so no practical experience could be gained. The ascent on a rather windy November day in 1897 was careless, to say the least. Moreover, no qualified airman was available as a test pilot. After ascending, the aluminum airship withstood a wind speed of nearly 20 km per hour until the drive belts slipped off the drive shaft. The airship pilot could think of nothing more clever than opening the valve immediately. The clumsy man escaped with his life, but the airship turned into a pile of rubble when he hit the ground. A French Science the most colorful figure in aviation at the turn of the century in Paris was Alberto Santos Dumont, son of a filthy wealthy owner of coffee plantations in Brazil. For the small, elegant man with the figure of a jockey, the word impossible did not exist. Alberto Santos Dumont was one of the most influential members of the Aero Club de France, which had emerged from the French Automobile Club in 1898. In the circle of aviation enthusiasts, they were convinced that aviation was a French science. After daring flights in free balloons, Alberto Santos Dumont turned his attention to the construction of dirigibles and built about a dozen models before turning to the heavier-than-air principle. He wanted to use an automobile engine for propulsion. Friends warned him that the vibrations caused by this would tear the balloon body to shreds. So the young Brazilian put it to the test. In the Bois de Boulogne, he had his motorcycle suspended from masts and found that the vibrations were less than on the ground. The Brazilians' first airship models were not particularly successful technically, as the flying sausages lacked a keel and thus the necessary rigidity. Santos Dumont largely compensated for this with audacious courage. 
In 1900, the petroleum king Henri Deutsch de la Merde offered 100,000 francs to the first person to fly around the Eiffel Tower from the grounds of the Aero Club near St. Cloud and return to the starting point within 30 minutes. Thus, 11 kilometers had to be covered in half an hour. Alberto Santos Dumont made his third attempt on October 19, 1901, this time with his new airship No. 6, which was 33 meters long with a diameter of 6 meters and equipped with a water-cooled four-cylinder engine of 12 horsepower. Only nine minutes after the ascent, he circumnavigated the lightning conductor of the Eiffel Tower but now had to deal with adverse winds. That's when the engine started to quit. With a quick decision, the 28-year-old darling of the Parisians abandoned the wheel. He worked his way to the engine, balancing to get the ignition and mixture settings in order. Meanwhile, number six was rapidly losing altitude with its nose down. The spectators took their breath away. The daring pilot brought the airship back under his control. He reached the control line in St. Claude at 29 minutes and 30 seconds after takeoff. He flew a loop and landed after another 70 seconds. Loudly, Santos Dumont shouted, Did I win? Eyewitnesses cheered him on. But the commission shook its head. Only after days and weeks did it award the prize to the millionaire. He had the money distributed among the poor of Paris and to his employees in the air yard. The controversy. Plump, semi-rigid, or rigid. For many years, there was a bitter dispute among airship men as to which design principle was superior for airships, the non-rigid design or the semi-rigid concept with a long keel, or the rigid airship, on whose strength the condition of the gas shells no longer exerts any influence. Neusnier's design, for example, can be classified as an impact airship. The entire aerostat collapsed when the gas escaped from the balloon envelope and the air from the ballonet. In the airships of Gifford and Renard and Krebs, on the other hand, a keel ensured that the weight of the gondola was distributed evenly over the entire envelope. In airships built according to this semi-rigid principle, the keel was later often moved into the balloon envelope to improve aerodynamics. The further logical development is represented by rigid airships such as David Swartz. They also include the airships of Count Zeppelin, whose lightweight metal frame was covered with fabric. The German Ferdinand Graf von Zeppelin, who lived from 1838 to 1917, was a Count of Württemberg, a cavalry general and the developer and founder of rigid airship construction. Impingement airships are very easy to build and dismantle so that when packed into a small space, they can be transported effortlessly to a new location. In contrast, non-rigid airships are pretty sensitive to rapid temperature changes. Rigid airships constantly maintain their streamlined shape regardless of the condition of the gas cells. By adjusting the position of the propeller hull, a considerable dynamic lift is generated, which experienced airship men skillfully exploit. The gas cells do not have to be completely full during takeoff, which prevents gas loss during the ascent. There are also other reasons why the rigid frame construction was used in the giant airships that Ferdinand Graf von Zeppelin was committed to from the beginning. The time of the first Zeppelins. During the American Civil War, Count Zeppelin participated in the ascent of an observation balloon. While doing so, he concluded that airships cruising beyond the front lines would significantly improve reconnaissance. His ideas were solidified when the officer observed bursts of French balloonists during the siege of Paris in 1870 and 71. The idea of a worldwide airship service never left his mind. As early as 1874, he was thinking of building an airship the size of an ocean liner that would carry 20 passengers in addition to cargo and mail. He saw great opportunities for air ferries, especially on routes that surface transport by land and water could only overcome with a particular difficulty. In diary notes from 1874, he formulated essential design features of his giant airships, a framework of vertically standing rings and longitudinal beams encased in a fabric shell, the division of the gas volume into several cells which can be filled and emptied individually, the presentation of a memorandum on airships to the King of Württemberg in the spring of 1887 marked the beginning of a series of petitions by the Count. He doggedly pursued his goal even though he met with disapproval from military officials and the Emperor. His plans were called outrageous and crazy. 
Count Zeppelin received an imperial patent in 1895 for his tow train of the skies, similar to the cars of an express train, the bow, middle and stern sections of this project were to be coupled together to form an airship. The inventor dispensed with this modular system for a revised and further developed design, the realization of which was endorsed by a commission of the Association of German Engineers. A company was finally formed to build the LZ-1 airship. Count Zeppelin contributed more than half of the capital stock of 800,000 marks. The LZ-1 airship, built from an aluminum frame, was 128 meters long and 11.3 meters in diameter. The 17 gas cells held a total of 11,300 cubic meters. Each of the two Daimler engines produced 14.2 horsepower but weighed 385 kilograms and acted on two propellers. The cigar-shaped airship had only a tiny rudder, whose effectiveness was limited. Instead of an elevator, there was a 100-kilogram lead weight under the ship, which was moved by a crank on a horizontal wire cable. LZ-1 was built in a floating hangar anchored in Lake Constance off Manzell near Friedrichshafen. Apart from Count Zeppelin, who was in command, there were four people in the two gondolas at the first launch on July 2, 1900. An eyewitness reported, Majestically, freed from every shackle, the airship floated away. Thousand voice cheers rang out on the shores. Because the holding crew at the stern had held the lines a little too long, the ascent was made at a severe angle. Graf Zeppelin correct this by bringing the trim weight forward with a hand crank. But then the hand crank broke. Finally, one of the engines failed. After only 18 minutes of travel, LZ-1 had to ditch. A Kaiser commission from Berlin described the airship as a valuable test piece but found LZ-1 unsuitable for military and civilian purposes. The maneuvering characteristics were judged to be satisfactory during the second flight, which lasted an hour and a half. After the third trip, the maximum speed was determined to be 32 km per hour. Because no money could be raised, Count Zeppelin had to liquidate his company with a heavy heart at the end of 1900. Despite all setbacks and failures, the Count was a man who did not give up. He fought with great energy to realize his idea of building airships suitable for regular service. He found a qualified chief designer, Dr. Ludwig Durr, who then directed the construction of all Zeppelins. Durr invented the triangular girder, which brought weight savings with greater strength and built his first wind tunnel as early as 1900. In October 1903, Count Zeppelin published an emergency call to save flying which, like other actions to raise money, met with virtually no response. The Count did not let up in his efforts. A lottery raised 125,000 marks. Benefactors provided further support so that in 1905 LZ-2 could be built with 285 horsepower engines. On its first flight on January 17, 1906, the new airship climbed unexpectedly fast and got caught in a strong westerly current. In this situation, of all things, one engine failed. LZ-2 drifted away. Since Lake Constance could no longer be reached, Count Zeppelin decided to land in a meadow in the Algar region, where the mighty airship was moored to fruit trees. They proved to be LZ-2's undoing. When the wind shifted at night, the ship was so badly damaged that the Count had to give the order to scrap it. He was close to despair. But the proceeds of a second lottery in Württemberg made it possible to build LZ-3. In the construction, for which parts of LZ-2 were used, the wind tunnel tests carried out by Dr. Durr paid off. The new airship was given double stabilizing surfaces. The rudders were between the horizontal surfaces, and the chief designer moved the elevators into the propeller stream. This allowed LZ-3 to be steered well. During one of the test flights, this third Zeppelin was in the air for eight hours. The speed was 12 meters per second, equivalent to 43 kilometers per hour. On 45 trips, LZ-3 covered a total of 4,398 kilometers. The performance of the new airship now also impressed Berlin. Under the designation Z-1, the ship, which had been lengthened to 136 meters, was taken over by the army in 1908 and scrapped in March 1913 because it had become obsolete. Public funds finally flowed in. LZ-4 was 136 meters long, had two Daimler engines with 105 horsepower, 
and for the first time was fitted with a small passenger cabin in the gangway, which was covered with fabric and could be walked on from bow to stern. With 12 people on board, Graf Zeppelin made a 12-hour trip to Switzerland on July 1, 1908. The passengers felt like true conquerors of the air ocean. Zeppelin ventured with the LZ-4 on the 24-hour trip along the Rhine to Mainz and back, which had been planned for some time. In Basel and Strasbourg, wherever the airship came into sight, it was greeted with bells ringing and firecrackers firing. Near Oppenheim, LZ-4 had to go down the Rhine to clear an engine malfunction. Mainz was reached around midnight. On the return trip, the same engine failed again. Count Zeppelin decided to head for Stuttgart to have the Daimler engine replaced there. The landing went smoothly. On August 4, 1908, a storm front tore the airship from its moorings. The gusts carried the LZ-4 several hundred meters. The hull brushed against trees was damaged and suddenly burst into flames. But Count Zeppelin's life's work was not destroyed. Spontaneous collections were made all over the German Reich. The Zeppelin donation raised millions. Kaiser Wilhelm II no longer regarded the Count as a madman but, at a visit to Manzell, described him as the greatest inventor of all time. The head of Luftschiffbau Zeppelin GmbH in Friedrichshafen succeeded in winning over several larger cities such as Berlin, Dusseldorf, Frankfurt, Hamburg, and Leipzig to the idea of commercial aviation. Airship hangars were built near these cities. On November 16, 1909, Deutsche Luftschifffahrtsik Tiengesellschaft, De Lag, headquartered in Frankfurt, became the first air transport company in the world to establish regular service between airports. That was the Aviafly podcast. We would be pleased about your like and your subscription because only this way can we continue to offer you exciting podcasts from the world of aviation. See you soon! aluminum sphere in place of a balloon basket, Swiss explorer Auguste Picard and his assistant Paul Kipfer penetrated the stratosphere, they reached 15,781 meters. That was the Aviafly podcast. We would be pleased about your like and your subscription because only this way can we continue to offer you exciting podcasts from the world of aviation. See you soon!